So in our research, we, we introduced this notion of, of structural virality. And so what that means is when you see something spread, you can map it out, uh, you know, that the person, one person gave it to another person and that person gave it to another person. And then imagine sort of mapping out that whole uh, tree of, of, uh, of, uh, of events where uh, that, that sort of starts from a, from a root and then spreads out to the leaves. And then you want to be able to characterize the structure of that tree. So you could imagine one kind of tree has uh, a lot of branches that come directly from the root and then it terminates. Or you could have another kind of tree that has many, many generations where there's just a few branches coming out at each node. Uh, and so even though those two trees might have the same number of nodes in them or leaves in them, uh, they might have very different structures. And so what we think of as viral is something that spreads over many generations where there's just a few branches at each generation. And uh, so we have this, this metric that is able to uh, differentiate between these two types of spread. Well, as I said in my talk, I think that, that you know, engineering social epidemics is a, is a fantasy. You know, this is something that we would, you know, in our dreams we would love to be able to do. I don't see any evidence that anyone can actually do this intentionally. You know, I, I know that people say that they can and it's a great sales pitch, but, you know, there have also been snake oil salesmen around for a long time and that's successful as well. Like if you, you know, if you... Uh, you know, promise people that you can engineer social epidemics, someone will believe you. If you try it enough, sometimes you'll, you'll look like you're successful and then you can claim that you know how to do this. I don't think anybody actually knows how to do that. I, you know, I really, I don't know why, I mean, <laughs> why any of these things really happen, but I think that uh, there's something very appealing about uh, the notion of the, the small thing that generates a huge change, right? Like we have, uh, there are lots of sort of books of popular history that are, you know, the map that changed the world, the fish that changed the world, the the sort of singular little seemingly insignificant breakthrough that had enormous consequences. Uh, we also do the same thing with people. You know, this, some particular group of individuals or some particular individual who you might not have thought was that important did something special and that changed the world. So I think we're very uh, attracted to this notion that a small change at some critical moment can have enormous uh, ramifications down the line and the tipping point is exactly that kind of thing where you sort of nothing's happening nothing's happening nothing's happening and then you just you just go a little bit too you know further and suddenly uh, everything happens and so uh, I don't quite know I mean of course things like that are interesting and so they attract our attention also I think there's a little bit of free lunchism in there that you you know we like as a as sort of change agents if you sort of have to go around and you know single-handedly convince every single person yourself, that seems kind of exhausting and slow and not very exciting. If you can somehow just get everything to tip, then uh, then in some sense all of that work is done for you. So I think that we we like this idea both because it's just sort of intrinsically appealing and also because it kind of solves lots of problems for us. Charles McKay and, uh, and Gustave Le Bon were writing about uh, crowd behavior, it was seen in a very negative light, that crowds were, were, uh, were, were sort of th thought of as mobs and, and that they, their, in, their intelligence was sort of considered to be like that of animals. And so there was a very kind of negative connotation to the the, 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 the behavior, or as they called it, the madness of crowds. And so I think 
when you have that, <coughs> um, uh, when you have the, the metaphor of madness as your, uh, as your sort of behavioral indicator, then it's natural to sort of think about that in terms of a disease. And so I, I think uh, the, the, the maybe that was part of what was going on, is that, the, is that you have these sort of, you know, sensible, upstanding citizens who are in some sense reduced to this mob-like behavior. And so what could possibly be doing that? Well, it must be something like a disease spreading from mind to mind. I think that what social media have done is, uh, from a you know from a from a scientist perspective, uh, it really is a the way we think of it is as a as a form of instrumentation, right? That that you know people have been talking to each other and influencing each other and passing information to each other for as long as there have been people, and until very recently that was all this invisible process, that there was no way you could see these interactions, there's no way that you could see that one person had been influenced by another person, uh, there was no way that you could uh, see the propagation of a single piece of information from person to person over many generations. And what social media, by digitizing all of that, uh, allows us to do is to actually observe uh, this sort of process happening and to observe it on a massive scale. So we can see, you know, in one of our studies, over a billion pieces of information spreading around a network of hundreds of millions of people. And this, uh, this allows us to do a kind of analysis that would have been inconceivable just a few years ago.